If everyone can have a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning and happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to a, a beautiful day in the Arboretum. The rain decided to, uh, to go away just in time for us to share and kind of in celebrating. Uh out of your day to be here to celebrate this moment. And, and it's, it's truly a wonderful opportunity to have places like this for the community, for the students, because I think back to uh, my early days as a scientist back in 2006 or something, and it was because I had access to a space next to a lake in, in Little Iowa, um, and I was wading through the wetlands of a protected area and looking at the, the flora and the fauna and asking questions and getting curious um, about the world around me. And I truly believe that it's spaces like this that really foster that growth and thinking and development, you know, not just for scientists, but really for all aspects of the world. Um, and it's truly um, amazing that um, this is also the 12th year um, that our campus is considered a tree campus in higher education. So we are truly supporting uh, the environment here in Jupiter, Florida. Um, and so, Kind of without further ado, we'll get started on our agenda today. So it's my true pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Perry. So he is the Dean of the Wilkes Honors College, and he will speak to us today a little bit about the importance of the Huxbourne uh, Arboretum at FAU and our campus. All right, well, welcome to the Robert J. Huckshorn Arboretum and our beautiful John D. MacArthur campus uh, right here in Jupiter. Uh, so when I hear people talk about the ecosystem uh, on the Jupiter campus here at FAU, often people talk about physical buildings or they talk about the ocean that's a, a five minute drive away or they talk about our world-class research institutes. But what I always think about is what stands right here in the backyard of the Wilkes Honors College as the mainstay of our ecosystem on this campus with all of these beautiful native trees and shrubs that offers 
uh, not only a fortress of tranquility for anybody, not just here at FAU, but anybody in the community. Um, I often uh, walk by here and see people doing yoga or petting dogs or, or doing something uh, that uh, gets them from the, the hustle and bustle of life. But it's much more than a, a fortress of tranquility. It's also a dynamic space to connect people, to learn, and to educate people. And that's exactly what happens here all the time, year-round, benefiting members of our community, our students, our faculty, and our staff. Uh, uh, you usually see uh, students and faculty benefiting from the gazebo right behind us uh, as part of their lecture uh, or uh, any kind of uh, topic that they want to discuss, often related to nature, right? Um, so this is a really special place. I'm really excited about the new developments that will continue to take place here. I understand that we just got a technology fee award that will bring some technology into the trees, but, but do not fear. Uh, I still believe in planting trees. And in fact, this year celebrates the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day, which started historically, I believe, somewhere uh, in Nebraska, I think, where they planted a tree. And what I like about these holidays, if you will, is that um, they're commemorating the past, but they're really about ensuring and preserving our future. And so with that, uh, I, I want to thank you again, uh, welcome you to this uh, a special day and uh, we'll continue with our program. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And thank you for everyone who's taken time today out of a busy schedule to come outside and enjoy uh, the Arboretum. I'm Mary Beth Mudrick. I represent FAU Foundation. And when you get out in nature and you're in trees, it, it brings your imagination out and makes you start to think about things a little bit differently. FAU Foundation was formed a year before FAU was formed because people gathered together and said, let's make a university. Let's make it for our working people. Let's make it accessible so that people can um, come to college right here in South Florida and, and better themselves. And that idea was a seed. And those initial gifts were seeds. And seeds are small things, but seeds, the power of them is the potential that's in them. So those seeds became a university and were standing in a place that had the same type of formation. It was the ideas and the dreams of Huck Shorn and, and Thomas Chastain that in this place that there was just a lawn they would put some seeds and some seedlings in place to, to become this place, which is a refuge and, a, and an oasis. So I'm so glad you would take time. What's also very exciting always about the Arboretum is how the people that um, love it most and best are faculty and staff. And they would never tell you, but as um, a foundation um, member, I, I see those are payroll deductions every week for years and years to celebrate something they care about. So if, if you would like to join that effort, you're going to see this in, in your package. You have an opportunity um, to also receive a, a signed print of a photograph taken here. Um, Elena Edwards found out kind of by accident while on um, Instagram a couple of years ago that Thule is a birder and she comes here because we're in the middle of a migratory path. And so the Arboretum continues um, to benefit people and I hope that it will continue to benefit people for the coming generations. Thank you for coming today. Thank you again, Mary Beth. That's, it's really a lot of work from the foundation that, again, really supports the university and the, the Arboretum in general. So we're very, very grateful to have her on our campus. 
And so uh, next we have our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Christopher Strain, who is a esteemed professor of history and American studies in the Harriet L. Wilkes Honors College. And he is here today to share with us a little bit about um, why we should be excited and, and help celebrate trees. Thank you, Bethany. Can I be honest with you all? You all seem like a group that can handle the truth. Can you handle the truth? Well, let's keep it real. I'm going to keep it real with you today. I'm going to be honest with you. Arbor Day is the least of our national holidays. It's true. It's true. I hate to be the bearer of bad news on Arbor Day, but it's, it's true. Even President's Day gets more respect. Arbor Day is like, it's like the Rodney Dangerfield of national holidays. You know, no respect. Even the, kid, the kids get a day off of, from school on President's Day, not for Arbor Day. In fact, I would be willing to wager that many Americans, perhaps most Americans, do not know when Arbor Day is, nor do they know what it honors. But what better thing to celebrate than a tree? Trees breathe in what we breathe out. Do you hear that breathing? And we breathe in what they breathe out. Franklin Delano Roosevelt once said, forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people. Trees furnish not only life-giving oxygen, but also shade, happily. They provide wood for our tools, lumber for our dwellings, and food in the form of nuts, seeds, and fruits. But trees are valuable far beyond their utility. They are beautiful, worthy of conservation for their own sake. They are the essence of natural beauty. As Khalil Gibran noted, poems that the earth writes upon the sky. I love that quote. And I also love that famous American quote about trees. As Joyce Kilmer famously wrote, say it with me, I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. Now we didn't always see trees in this light. For most of U.S. history, a stump was a symbol of progress, of land cleared and land tamed and made productive. Paul Bunyan was a larger than life folk hero who swung a mighty ax to fell even the biggest uh, trees. And the old growth forests of redwoods and sequoias fed America's sawmills just as much as lesser pines and pin oaks. Happily, we know trees differently now, having entered into a new and different relationship with our nation's forests and natural places. A tree, as George Nakashima has noted, is our most intimate contact with nature. And today we plant, nourish, and replenish trees even as we continue to use them toward our own ends. So today we pause in this beautiful place, the Robert J. Huckshorn Arboretum, to appreciate our leafy friends. Today is a day for trees and for nature-loving, dirt-worshiping tree huggers, such as myself, and presumably all of you. May we continue to cherish trees and give them as much as they give to us. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, my co-instructor, my neighbor, and my friend, Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Associate Professor of Writing, Rachel Luria. I have to lower the mic considerably. Uh, 
our heart differential. Uh, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction of Arbor Day and for giving Arbor Day its due. I didn't know it was the least, but it should be the most. And thank you for making that connection between uh, trees and poetry, which makes the natural transition into uh, my portion, which is to talk about National Poetry Month, which we are also here to celebrate. Uh, so April is National Poetry Month. According to the Academy of Poets, it was first launched in 1996. And we might wonder why April? Why is April National Poetry Month? Is it because one of the world's greatest poets called it the cruelest month? Cruel because April invites hope, just as poetry invites hope. And hope invites the possibility of disappointment. T.S. Eliot called April the cruelest month in his poem, The Wasteland, written in the aftermath of the 1918 global pandemic, a time when hope would certainly have felt cruel. As we reflect on the aftermath of our own pandemic, we too may be suspicious of the feeling, but we mustn't be. Hope is an act of rebirth and renewal. It's an act of bravery. And as we stand among the trees and the first new shoots of spring, we are reminded that nature never loses hope and neither does the poet, which is why it is my great pleasure to celebrate Arbor Day and National Poetry Month with you and to introduce the lovely, rejuvenating poetry of our winning student and faculty poets. In a moment, I will read the winning student poem and then introduce Taylor Haygood, our winning faculty poet. But first, I want to let you know that you can read the first through third place winners in the honorable mentions on our poetry walk. So please stick around and, and wander and read the lovely poetry that was submitted. Uh, so our first poem is from our student Grace Xion, a junior here at the Honors College, and her poem is entitled A Common Case of Writer's Block, and I will do my best to give it its due. It's quite hard to write under a moonlit sky, beneath a dim sidewalk lantern, and under a bright white light that never flickers, not once or twice. It's terribly hard to write when distant engines run to and fro, when raindrops plop and crickets sing as if it were their last day on earth. It's so hard to write with so many sounds and sights begging to be witnessed. I cannot write or sleep or... Then don't write. Don't sleep or think. Be free from it all and follow that star or count the moths that crowd the lamplight just watch and pay attention to the constant and reliable cloudless sky. Don't cover your ears and sing with the mockingbird. Do not stop to write or think or sleep and just follow the path wherever it goes. So even though she's not here, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> she couldn't be it with us today, but her, her poetry could. Uh, and now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce our faculty winner, professor of American literature and author of literary criticism with six books and over 40 articles on William Faulkner and other literary greats. His forthcoming book, String Bean, The Life, of Murder of a, uh, Life and Murder of a Country Music Legend, is a biography and true crime book that tells the story of Grand Old Opry banjo player, singer, and comedian David Stringbean Aikman. And I believe you got an email from Loretta Lynn as part of the process, which is amazing, uh, and I can't wait to read it. Uh, please welcome scholar and poet Taylor Haygood. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I just want to take a minute. I know we don't have too much time and people have to be somewhere probably soon, but uh, before I say anything else, I want to say uh, what a great honor it is to me to be here and to be a part of this. And uh, I, it's very moving for me to see all these pictures on this screen. Uh, it brings back a lot of memories. I, did, I met uh, Dr. Huckshorn only a couple of times and uh, I can't claim to know him well, but I I'm well aware of his legacy, and this is only part of it. Uh, I want to say thank you to Rachel, uh, who is such a, a lovely person in so many ways, and uh, uh, Professor Strain, I've known for a very long time, and uh, Miguel and Bill and everybody here uh, I've known for a while, and I especially want to say um, how much I appreciate Elena, um, who means more to me than she knows. So. Uh, <clears throat> the poem I have is entitled Huckshorn Arboretum, and I'll just say uh, one thing or two about it, um, just so that it will make some kind of sense, I guess. Um, just uh, this 
uh, space means a very great deal to me. I'm no longer located on this campus, but I do a lot of lecturing with OSHA Lifelong Learning, and I'm here about caught like flies in blue pumbago sepals, the ensnaring sweet and light-winged. On the flower, the leptotus cassius undulates, ventrals flashing eyes, black outlined in orange, peering out from the green webbing like the woman's in the wallpaper. Bits of sunlight flutter into this canopy shade, bright orange and light pink confetti aimlessly purposeful, drawn by the monkey's earring, a vaguely piratical revel lecturing on how nonlinearity ripens the inner fruit of the soul while a plant full of, comp of promise fails the kidneys. This plot is not fully contrived. Vines festooning the white gazebo charm and flirt in an unstudied language. Birds import rouge without customs clearance. Beatrix fair errands say that in a garden, things should look as though they like to grow in it. The mystery of this path, leading in, leading out, its demarcating kith of docent, reminds that its secret has always been known. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And uh, we get to learn a little something about history and art and, and culture, as well as hear a beautiful poem. So thank you. Uh, so Arboretum Manager and Education and Training Coordinator for the Center of Environmental Studies, Elena Edwards, has been here from the beginning. As you've seen in the slideshow, this was literally a plot of grass, and she's been nurturing it since 2004. With the help of volunteers, she's made it into the beautiful space you see today. Uh, she was also interviewed by CBS Sunday Morning, which makes her akin to a, a deity in my book. Uh, check it out. Google it. Uh, and please welcome Elena Edwards. She's going to tell you about what's on the horizon. Good morning. I don't know how I'm, how I'm supposed to follow all of these um, wonderful talks. Um, and Taylor, that poem was amazing. That's really awesome. And I'm sure um, the Huckshorns are listening, they are listening online, I'm sure they loved it as well. I'll have to make sure to send them a copy. Um, this past year has been one of the most exciting of my 22 years at FAU. As most of you know, I've managed the Arboretum since its inception, but because there hasn't really been funding, um, it was always just a small percent of my time. I'm uh, just kind of managing it between all of my other tasks. Early last year, with budgets getting tighter as a result of the pandemic, it became clear that our center wouldn't be able to continue funding my time to manage the Arboretum. That's when Mary Beth Mudrick came to me with the idea of writing a proposal to the Chastain Charitable Foundation to fund mental health programs in the Arboretum. I partnered with FAU Thrive's Laura Vernon to write the Thriving Outside in the Arboretum proposal. And just about this time last year, we learned that we won the award. As a result of this funding, I've been able to implement some really awesome programs in the Arboretum, which started last fall. We've done bird walks coordinated in partnership with the Everglades Audubon Society. Um, we've got Scott Zucker and Mary Young here today, and I've worked with them to um, create some great walks here in the Arboretum, and we've seen some amazing things on those walks. Um, we've done butterfly walks where I've persuaded participants to get on their hands and knees to view tiny caterpillars and eggs. Uh, we've had a National Day of Writing coordinated with Rachel Luria and her cliche club students. Not only was that an awesome partnership, I've now made a wonderful new friend um, we've had Gospel in the Trees coordinated with FAU's Kingdom Club after I encountered Zion Strasser in the Arboretum here one day with his guitar. I think Zion is here, over there, and he has a wonderful poem on the walk you should check out. And probably one of my favorite activities that we've offered this spring is Tai Chi in the Trees. <clears throat> Laura Vernon said after the first class that it was magical, and it really is. 
Then, in addition to these exciting programs, the funding also enabled us to begin the creation of an outdoor classroom. Professors often use the gazebo for classes, but it's not the ideal setup. So Bill O'Brien and I worked with several Honors College faculty to strategize what would be needed for an ideal outdoor classroom. The picnic tables you see just over there are just the beginning. With leverage from our Chastain funding, we applied for and won from a tech fee grant called Tech in the Trees was the name of our proposal. And so with this combined funding, our outdoor classroom will have pavers, sail shade covers, electrical outlets, networking, Wi-Fi, and we'll also have security cameras out here. We've had things stolen. So fingers crossed that the classroom will be ready for faculty to use with their students by fall of 2022. And of course, none of these programs would have been possible without the generous funding from the Chastain Charitable Foundation. So now I would like to introduce Ms. Victoria Middlebrooks, who is a trustee of the Chastain Charitable Foundation to share a little bit with us about the foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an, it's an honor to be with all of you today. Um, and it's a great pleasure to represent the Chastain Fair Charitable Foundation and to honor the foresight of Tom Chastain, who set up the foundation. He and his father cared deeply about Florida's environment. I'm a sixth generation Floridian, and I also share uh, their hopes and dreams for this beautiful state. The Chastains were ranchers managing and working large portions of land west of here. When Robert Huckshorn dreamed of an arboretum to create a place of reflection and education on this beautiful campus, Tom Chastain added the gazebo at its centerpiece. I'm sure both of the men are pleased that a dream that began with seedlings and a shelter would become a place where wildlife and people thrive, just like we are here today. Tom Chastain cared just as deeply for the people of Florida as he did the environment. The Chastain Foundation continues his legacy by supporting Wilkes Honors College Student Scholarships, a distinguished Chastain lecture series during the Honors College Annual Research Symposium, support for the environmental outreach of Pine Jog, and he created the Chastain Johnston Chair of Middle Eastern Studies at FAU. May we all dr have the dreams that outlast us and benefit the places and people of tomorrow just like he did. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, again, these valuable programs in the Arboretum would not have been possible without the Foundation's support, and we are incredibly grateful. Um, before we conclude today's program, I just want to give a quick thank you to a few people who are always supportive of me out here in the Arboretum. Michelle, Common Eric, um, I couldn't do any of this without you because you're always my, my sidekick to help me get things done, so I thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank all the faculty who have worked with me on the Thriving Outside program um, to help it make, uh, make it be a success. Rachel, my new BFF, <laughs> uh, Bill O'Brien, and um, Taylor, thanks for being here today. And Dean Perry, thank you so much for being so supportive. And so before we um, adjourn, I just want to let you guys know we do have some beautiful cookies back here in the shape of trees. They're quite lovely. And some lemonade. And we do have a few plants for giveaway that we can distribute to you. So if you want to um, enjoy yourself, and I'm happy to give little tours around the Arboretum if anybody is interested. So thank you so much for coming today. And have a wonderful Arbor Day.
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.